through it all, we can rest in that fact and praise God. So what we've looked at is we've looked at and revisited Psalms 23.1, what it means to, have to say confidently that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We then went and excised verses 4 through 6 and looked at them very closely to see what it means and, and discover that God comforts us. And so with those two areas that we looked at, our third area talks about God's, our response to God's comfort and, and protection. What is our response? Now, Isaiah 12, 1 through 6, gives us that focus. And I would invite you, as you go into Isaiah 12, read that whole chapter and read it again. Because Isaiah 12, 1 through 6, it's a pretty short chapter. Like I said, it's interesting that Isaiah 12, uh, 1 through 6 is a complete chapter there in Isaiah, and in Psalms 23, it's verses 1 through 6. So they kind of, <laughs> interestingly enough, have a parallel to each other. But let me read, as we go into this third part of the message, let me read Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. And you can follow along with me in your Bibles. Uh, you can listen as I read this, and just let it soak in. Let it speak to your heart. Ask yourselves what it means to my heart. But here it says in Isaiah 12, verse 1, In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Verse 4 continues. In that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for what he has done, glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. It's a beautiful verse. And this is the time when, when Israel was going through a tough moment of exile. That they needed some comfort. That they needed some guidance. And it was in place on Isaiah's heart through the Holy Spirit to bring this out. And so this is the same response that Isaiah put forth here for the Israelites. It's the same response that we have knowing that our Lord is a good shepherd. He protects and he comforts us. So let's look at those verses. In Isaiah 12.1, it's a very simple verse that says, I will praise you. Quite simply, it's what it says. And oftentimes, we forget to praise him, especially against the aspects of how he protects and comforts us. And when I read through this, these verses and I sat back and, and let it speak to my heart, one song just kept on coming back to me, and it's one that we always sing, especially at the Lord's Supper, and it's the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And the next time we sing that song, what we have to realize is we need to sing it very slowly and meaningfully and see exactly what that means when we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And realize that we have to praise him because he is deserving of all our praise and honor. Two through four are other verses that kind of lead up to the point where we are compelled to thank God. So one response is to praise God. The other response is that we've seen in, in verses 2 through 4 of Isaiah 12 is to thank God. And so it's in a very important part of our one-two punch, praising and thanking God. Thanking our Lord is a command and it is necessary to place Him in the right place in our own hearts. I understand and I've always felt that an ungrateful soul is one that is hardened and destined for destruction. It is when we thank God and have a soul that's thankful that we can call out his name and no other name is necessary or worthy. 
We see this in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 17. It's one of my favorite verses, and I lean back on it quite a bit, because in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, it says, Be joyful always. Be joyful always. That doesn't mean just be joyful on a Friday afternoon when you get off work. That means be joyful all the time. Pray continually. Oh, that's another command, another imperative that comes off of that verse, those verses. Pray continually, which means pray continually. <laughs> and it cannot be a, along these and thou's and thus's and uh, oh, be, be, oh, lo, me, or whatever. Or, or, you know, it could be a very easy, quick prayer. I call them snippet prayers. I do it all the time in my car. People probably think I'm insane when they pull up next to me and I'm talking to myself. No, I'm actually talking to my Lord. It's a lot better person to talk to. So, you know, you can pray anytime, anywhere. Because the Lord is with you all the time. His presence is there in the car. His presence is there in the shower. His presence is there before you eat, after you eat, before you go to bed, when you get up. And that's the beauty of our Lord being our good shepherd, protecting, comforting, guiding, and providing for us. Answered prayers. Because prayers do get answered. And we see that in this church. One of the key factors that has kept this church alive and loving, and as it is right now, is through prayer. I've seen it. And I'm just a rookie here. But I've seen it, and I'm sure that all you all have been here for a lot longer than I've ever been around, have understand and realized that prayer is very important. I prayed with Don Watson last night as we talked on the phone, and we prayed and prayed and prayed. And he gave me a benediction that was very, very deep and dear to me when he said, you know, to be blessed. And I said, Don, I'm worried about the church right now, that we're not meeting regularly and, and things are going on. And Don said, do not worry, Brother Ed. He always calls me Brother Ed. This church will go on. But, you know, he's a very dear, deep, faithful man. And so it's a, a joy to see and hear that he's going through some things that a lot of us would not ever want to go through. And he has every right to be despondent. But he's not. And you know why that is? Is because he realizes that his good shepherd, our good shepherd, is providing, comforting, healing, and taking care of us. We need to proclaim his glorious things. And this talks about the last couple of verses in Isaiah 12, verses 5 through 6, talks about shouting to the Lord and proclaiming what he's done. And that's in essence, what we have to do. That's why I'm here today. I needed to proclaim God and the gospel, the good news that our Lord died on a cross for our sins, and if we accept that sacrifice by faith into our hearts, that we can be forgiven because of that, and accept Him into our hearts through faith, that we can be saved also. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what brings you to being one of the sheep in the flock of the Good Shepherd. And, you know, we need to proclaim his glorious things to people that are without hope. Because one of the things that Satan really loves is when people are not hopeful, when people are fearful, and, and when they're doubtful. He thrives on that. And there's not a single person in this room that wants Satan to have the upper hand on whatever's going on in the life of this church and the life of our own selves. We need to sit there and understand that our God is our good shepherd. Satan's a wolf that's on the fringes trying to go into that flock and destroy it. He will not destroy this church. This church is going to stand for our Lord. It's going to be around no matter what comes and what may come because this is our Lord's church. I'm getting all spun up. I need to watch out. But the thing is, is that Saint would love nothing more than sit there and, and grab a hold of that, destroy us. What we need to do is understand that 
we have to have people hear the gospel. The importance is, is to proclaim God's glorious works and our faith is not lost. And it's seen in, in Romans 10, uh, 13 through 17, it talks about that, where we need to sit there and uh, be with our Lord and, and proclaim. Because it says in, in, uh, in Romans 10, 13 through 17, this is a very important thing. I've always learned to lean on this. Because 10 or 13, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's Romans 10, 13. And then 14 asks some very important questions that all preachers kind of look at. It says this in 14. How then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can, they, how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so it kind of ties into each other. It kind of compels each other as we go into what it means to witness and the importance of witnessing. Because if nobody can hear God's word, how can they know what to believe? And if they don't believe, how can they be saved? And witnessing is not just relegated to me. Witnessing is relegated to each one of us. Because there's not much to... Uh, fall short of telling people about your faith because that faith and your faith is something that's always yours and nobody can take that away from you. And that's the reason and the purpose for your faith. So as we go into the conclusion here, it says we discovered three things this morning. The personal aspect of Psalms 23 is seen in that first verse where it says the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He chose us and redeemed us. We did not first choose him. He's always chosen us all our times. The second thing we looked at was that our shepherd protects and comforts us, as we've seen in verses 4 through 6. You see, he walks with us, and he talks with us. And I'm singing another song here. But the thing is, is that he is and does that. He walks and talks with us during dark times. He blesses us to the point of overflowing, and he comforts us knowing that goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. And the final ultimate blessing is that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our response is to acknowledge that our Lord uh, is with us. And through that, we should respond with praising him, thanking him, and proclaiming what he has done for us in our lives. The bottom line is that all of Psalm 23 displays God's love for us. It's not one that is just read in a, in a funeral procession or something that's at a graveside service, even though it does happen quite a bit. But really, when you look back at it and you want a time of reading something that will comfort you, put you at ease, allow you to realize that God is there, that's the psalm to read. So I invite everybody to read Psalm 23 this coming week. Look at it. Study it. Tear it apart. See exactly how it's speaking to you. Whenever you read a verse of Scripture, there's three things you should ask yourself. How is that verse speaking to my heart? How does that work in my life? How can I apply that to my own life? And then the third thing is, is that how can I share that with others about what I've read and found out with that verse? So every time you read a verse, apply it to yourself. Whenever you see an I in there, put your name in there. Put your name in there where it says, I, Lord is my shepherd, Ed will not want. So that's one way that you can personalize what you do, make scriptures bounce out, come alive to you. We need to lean on God and truly live out the verses that we see in those six verses. We need to lean in, let God hold us up, let God take care of us. Do not pay any type of lip service to what we were reading here, but actually live it out and apply it. Because, see, our Lord protects us. Our Lord provides for us. And our Lord comforts us. Now and forevermore. And we can praise God for that. So as we close, there's an invitation. 
And that invitation is that those that are watching or listening or whatever it might be, and you're going into your quiet time, you're reading Psalms 23. Ask yourselves, how content and comforted are you right now? What's standing in your way? And what it really means is that you need to come to Jesus and rest in him. Allow him to protect and provide for you in all your needs. Above all, let Jesus satisfy your need for salvation and eternal life, for it's there for you in the taking. It's a simple prayer that includes three aspects, accepting the fact that you're a sinner, believing that you can be forgiven, and then confessing your sins and asking him into your heart. It's a simple ABC process. And that's why I invite you to do at this particular time. And I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'll be here uh, to uh, do the next message next week. So thanks a lot. I'm going to close. Father, thank you for the day and for your love and, and for your word that uh, gives us a light to our path. We thank you for your, just your peace, your comfort, your joy that come through knowing you as the good shepherd. And Lord, I thank you so much that we can be like sheep, realizing that we have to rest on you, lead and follow where you would have us go, and depend upon what we need uh, in our lives to live effective Christian lives for those that are lost and, and for you to serve you, um, that are, for people that are lost. Lord, thank you so much for uh, the people in this church. I pray you continue to bless us as we go. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.